When he saw him, he fell at his feet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you spotted this week's deliberate mistake? Ooh, got away with that one then. Right. Jeremy Clarkson was recently interviewed by Farmers Weekly. Clarkson bought a farm, about a thousand acres, in um, Oxfordshire in 2008. And it was originally managed by a local farmer. But when the farmer retired, Clarkson asked himself a typical Top Gear question. How hard can it be? And so he decided to run the farm himself. Well, the consequences of that are revealed on a series running on Amazon Prime. And needless to say, Clarkson continually makes a mess of things. He buys himself a tractor, but he buys himself a Lamborghini 270 horsepower tractor, which he's very pleased with. But it's too big and it won't fit in his barns, nor can it fit through any of his gateposts. And the instructions are in German, so he can't read any of them. No surprises there then. But if you watch carefully behind all the TV gimmicks and all the rest which are necessary to make this a product which sells and is profitable, there is another side to Clarkson's farming. If you look carefully at the overhead shots of his fields, you will see that around the edges of his fields, there are 20 to 30 foot borders of wild flowers and insects. He doesn't plough right to the edges of the fields. He creates a wetland to encourage biodiversity and wildlife. He keeps bees. He ploughs paths through the middles of his crops to allow insects to travel through the crops more readily because they're good for the harvest. And if you watch his tractor pulling a cultivator across a field, you'll notice it is followed by crowds of birds. Now I can remember as a wee lad watching farmers ploughing and they were always followed by crowds of birds, but not these days. The soil generally has died. But on Clarkson's farm, the soil is rich in worms and bugs, and so the birds follow it. The earth has paid a price for the harvest we demand of it. Now, as a result of his experience, Farmers Weekly interviewed Clarkson. How hard can it be? Well, as it turns out, very hard. Clarkson admits farming is virtually impossible. He said, I couldn't do this unless I was followed around by an Amazon t television crew. And that's what actually paid his, his wages for that year. And of course, when he's not doing that, he can go and do who wants to be a millionaire. One of the things he cannot understand is how in his farm, they can grow and produce produce and crops and make honey. They can pick it with their own hands. They can transport it in their own vehicles. They can sell it in their own shop and still find the supermarkets do it cheaper than them. And how can that be right? And so behind all the television bluster and stunts, there's a serious question. What price are we paying? What price for the food that works the earth to destruction? What price for cheap milk, cheap vegetables, cheap wheat, when farmers cannot make ends meet? At the end of farming a thousand acres for a year, and yes, Clarkson gets it all wrong, but if you have the chance to watch the series, you'll know he's supported by people who actually do know what they're doing. And at the end of that year, his profit for the year on a thousand acre farm is 144 pounds. That's 40 pence a day. And you cannot live on 40 pence a day. And so he asked the question, what price for a way of living which takes and takes, but never asks if this is sustainable? And that brings me to the gospel for today. And you might think the link is tenuous, but bear with me. This is a typical supermarket bargain. You get two miracles for the price of one. But there is still a price. Or rather, there's several prices, and I'll tell you just three of them. 
Consider, first of all, Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, whose little daughter is ill. Now, we're told she is 12, and in Jewish tradition, a girl becomes a woman when she is 12 years and one day old. So this girl is on the brink of womanhood. She's got a whole life ahead of her, but she is ill, desperately ill. Now, Jairus, as leader of the synagogue, was an important person. He would have had standing within the community. He bore serious responsibilities. And he was a significant person people would have looked up to. So he would be respected and he would be honoured. And yet this man with that social standing goes to Jesus for help. And Jesus, remember, is a man who's regarded as a troublemaker and a rebel. A man who stirred up trouble and caused respectable people outrage. This was a man who kept bad company and wherever he went caused offence. And so there is a terrible price for Jairus to pay to go to Jesus for help. And more than that, this leader of the community throws himself at this wandering preacher's feet. He was throwing everything away, his position, his standing, everything for the sake of his daughter. Love has a price and Jairus was willing to pay it. And then we come to this woman in the crowd. Now, we're not told her name. We're never, she's never heard of again. In this one brief moment, her life is exposed to history. And her illness would have made her into an outcast because an issue of blood made her unclean. Nobody would eat with her. Nobody would walk with her. Nobody would talk with her or be seen with her in public. Nobody would touch her. She would have been totally excluded from society, forbidden to be with others. And so her illness did not just cause physical suffering. She is condemned to a life of loneliness and rejection. And we would recognize today the emotional, the psychological and the spiritual trauma which she endured. She paid a price, not even daring to ask Jesus for help because she knew, she feared she would be rejected. No Jewish man would converse with an unknown woman and certainly not one marked by an issue of blood. She cannot come to him. She cannot speak to him. She cannot throw herself at Jesus' feet straight away. All she can do is reach out in anonymity within the crowd and just touch the hem of his garments. And that's all God needs. That's all God needs. Her faith was costly. It's all God needs that she had that faith that if she just did this thing, then she would be healed. And we forget that. That's all God needs. The tiniest step from us. That's all he needs. But, <coughs> but there is another price as well. This isn't a something for nothing event. God doesn't do things on the cheap. Jesus pays a price. The moment she touches him, he feels power has gone from him. He knows a cost has been paid for this healing. And it's a price he's more than willing to pay. <clears throat> Whatever happens next in our society and in our communities as we move from where we've been for the past 12, 15 months into whatever comes next. And I keep saying to people, there is no such world as post-COVID. COVID is with us. There may be post-pandemic but there will not be post-COVID. Whatever happens next in our community will involve a price. More than one price, several. The cost of what comes next will not be cheap. We need to learn to do things differently and to be different. And this is something we know. And we know that change never comes cheap. We know that things that matter always bear a cost. And the question is, are we willing to pay it? We know that building relationships costs. We know that sustaining community costs. We know that nurturing a community society that treats people decently has a price. And in so many things, everything we need to do next means someone has to do something to make that happen. Everything has a price and a cost. Nothing will happen cheap. And so Jeremy Clarkson is right. And I never thought I'd heard myself saying that from a pulpit. It isn't easy growing things. 
The something for nothing society cannot last. That's what got us to where we are now. It empties people, it drains resources, it puts nothing back. We can't keep having more and more for less and less. And this story is about people looking for things to be different. They can be different, but there has to be a price. There has to be a cost, and we have to be willing to pay it. Because usually it's paid by somebody else. If we want cheap food, it is the unseen farmer who pays the price of that. If we want goods brought from abroad cheaply, it's the unseen fairer on an unworthy ship that pays the price for that. If we want cheap clothes, it's the unseen factory worker on the other side of the world who pays the price for that. And if we want things to be competitive, it's the unseen person who loses their job that pays the price for that. Change can happen, but it can only be for the better when we recognise everything has a price and we are willing to pay our fair share in making a better world and covering the cost of it. And a prayer which is about stewardship. Give, Lord, to all who till the ground wisdom to understand your laws and to cooperate with your wise ordering of the world. And grant that the plentiful fruits of the earth may not be hoarded by the selfish or squandered by the foolish, but that the needs of all shall be supplied according to the new order of your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen.